Hello, and welcome to this webinar on organic apple production and marketing, a beginner's guide. This hour-long webinar is presented by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, a nonprofit organization with offices across the United States. NCAT works in the areas of sustainable energy, sustainable communities, and sustainable agriculture. My name is Jeff Berkeley. I'm Outreach Director for one of NCAT's major programs, the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, also called ATRA. NCAT has managed ATRA for more than 20 years with funding provided by the United States Department of Agriculture. We provide extensive information on how to farm more sustainably, including information on crops, livestock, organic certification, farm energy, and many other topics. You can visit our ATRA website at atra.ncap.org. We are grateful to the USDA's Rural Business Cooperative Service for financial support for these webinars. And now a quick bit, a bit of housekeeping before we get started with our webinar on organic apple production and marketing. During this hour-long webinar, you'll be able to type in questions in the box on the side of your computer screen. We'll review these questions during the hour webinar and then try to get through as many as possible during a Q&A session with our two presenters at the end of the webinar. So the webinar will last about an hour and then the Q&A session for maybe 10 or 15 minutes at the end also. A reminder too that if you miss anything during the webinar, we will be archiving the entire webinar on our ATRA website within a day following the webinar. So you'll be able to watch the webinar at your leisure at any time. <clears throat> The presenters for today's webinars are NCAT horticulturalists Guy Ames and Tammy Hinman. Tammy Hinman has an extensive background in sustainable agriculture work in New York State and Arizona, as well as in Montana and Colorado. Tammy received her bachelor's degree from Colorado State University in horticulture, food crops, and entomology. Experience includes work as a market gardener, a communications specialist with Cornell University Cooperative Extension, and work with the Northeast Organic Farming Association on organic certification issues. Tammy is currently a staff horticulturalist working out of NCAT's headquarters office in Montana. Our second speaker, Guy Ames, has a bachelor's degree in history and English and a master's degree in horticulture, both from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. In the past, Guy has been a professional nurseryman and orchardist, as well as a technical writer in the areas of sustainable fruit production. Guy is currently based in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where he's a horticulturalist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. With that intro, I'll turn it over to Guy Ames to start our webinar, and we'll kick it off from there. Guy? Okay, thanks. Um, I want you to note, first of all, that this is a, a beginner's guide, and maybe to give you a little bit more uh, reason to listen closely. Uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about my background as an orchardist, and uh, I, I hope that it's a cautionary tale. Uh, in 1971, yes, I'm that old. In 1971, I was 19 and bought my first piece of land and and, and established my first orchard. And of course, I was going to do it organically, and uh, uh, met with less than than stellar success. And somewhere along the way, I realized. Or, so I went back to the University of Arkansas, I got this degree in pomology, horticulture, fruit trees, you know, and uh, tried again, planted another orchard in, in 1980, and uh, that one was a little bit bigger for me, about 300 trees. And uh, in 1989, I established yet a third orchard, uh, and frankly, I didn't do that well. And the reason that uh, I didn't do that well will be covered in this, this webinar. Uh, it's going to be a quite a bit different for you out, out west as it is for the listeners in the east. Uh, I established my orchards in, in, in northwest Arkansas, and that may be one of the problems I had. But anyway, I want to uh, let you know that I've had a lot of experience with this stuff. We're going to go over a lot of details, pests, and diseases, and it's absolutely necessary that you understand that this is a, a tricky business, organic apple orcharding. So that's why we've... Uh, uh, modeled this. That's why we've planned and designed this webinar the way that it is. Okay, so we've got a little uh, outline here. You can see what, what we're going to be talking about. Uh, first of all, we've got to talk about the climate in the parts of the United States. We're going to talk about diseases and disease control. Spent a lot of time on that. Insects and mite control. Uh, control of vertebrate pests like deer and voles. 
And then Tammy's going to come on and then tell you about some farmscaping and, and uh, weeds and some of the economics. Now, uh, even though I've given you this caution, I want you to understand that things have changed. And one of the reasons that uh, I'm excited about giving this webinar now is that there are at least four good reasons why uh, organic orcharding looks a little more promising now than it did you know, 20 years ago. And I'll just tease you right now with those things. Kale and clay surround. Uh, universities are finally taking that seriously and, and doing some very good research in this area. The local food phenomenon can make a huge difference for those people wanting to grow apples organically. And then, of course, uh, there's the cosmetic um, requirements for apples, and um, that's going to change a little bit. Um, that's going to make a change quite a bit with the local food, and uh, that's going to help relax the cosmetic standards. And, of course, now there are a few of us in the East that are actually making there's quite a few organic orchards in the West. We'll talk about that. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to get right into it. Oh, first of all, if you need more information on, on organic fertility especially, we, we give that short shrift. And uh, if you need more information on anything, you know, go to our website. Go to Atra's website. We've got some great pubs there. And uh, our Apple pub will be on there. A new update of that will be on there in about two weeks, I think, pretty soon anyway. All right. First of all, there's some uh, serious differences between the eastern and western United States and to some degree some of these other little uh, subclimates. But we've got to make it clear there's some, some big differences between the east and the west when it comes to organic apple production. If you look roughly at the middle of the map, though, you'll see what's called the tree line. And that's a line roughly uh, separating the eastern woodlands from the treeless plains. In the eastern half of the US, uh, apple production, organic apple production especially, is complicated by increased humidity and uh, the humidity and, and, and rainfall that fosters trees and, and plant growth the way that it does means that we have a lot more diseases and pests in the east. If you look at the west, especially the arid west, and um, let's look at, at the apple growing capital of the world, Wenatchee, Washington, it's essentially irrigated desert and uh, the water supplies uh, the needs for the tree there, but uh, the climate and ecology of the desert will not support uh, the pests and the diseases, at least not to the degree that we have in the east. So in short, the easier place to do it organically is in the, is in the west by far. Coastal west is a little bit different than the west, but it's going to be a lot tougher for you in the east, northeast and southeast. Um, I want to say just something in general about, about disease. Uh, this is the disease triangle, and I'm going to come back. I'll refer to this a few other times. Uh, and one of the reasons I want to show you this is so that you're not just cook picking it all the time. So you have some understanding of what's going on in your orchard. And you cannot have disease unless you have the pathogen. It sounds simple, but it's true. And uh, for instance, cedar apple rust. If you don't have cedars, eastern red cedars, it's actually juniper. A Juniperus virginiana. If you don't have that, you're not going to have cedar apple rust. So you don't have to worry about that one. Uh, and it would be true of any other disease. If the inoculum's not there, you're not going to have it. You have to have a susceptible host looking down at that right part of the triangle. Uh, if the apple variety is not susceptible to scab, like Liberty or Freedom or some of these other scab immune apples, you're not going to have it. You don't have to worry about it. And then, of course, you have to have a conducive environment. And that's what I was alluding to when I was talking about the east versus west there. But if you don't have the proper environment for the pathogen to uh, live and infect, then you're not going to have disease. So like I said, try to get, keep that in the back of your mind, and I'll refer back to it occasionally. All right, so you should be able to extrapolate from what I've said so far that in different parts of the country, you're going to have uh, different diseases. Try not to pay attention to the insects right now on this map. We'll come back to those later. But uh, you can see. When you're looking at uh, the eastern part of the United States, there's uh, many more diseases you have to worry about. Out west, not near so many. And, uh, and just in general, the disease pressure, especially in the arid west, is greatly reduced. By the way, uh, if you have, you know, you're trying to take notes, but remember this is going to be recorded and, and on our ATRA website. So you'll be able to come back and look at these charts and any other bit of information that's on here. All right. Um, 
disease resistance. This is, uh, this is one of the things that I alluded to in the university research has changed things. When uh, uh, Cornell and Purdue, Rutgers, and Illinois in a cooperative breeding project started uh, breeding for disease resistance, uh, maybe some of the first releases weren't that great, but boy, they really have some super high quality uh, scab immune apples, and a lot of these scab immune apples are actually uh, resistant to other diseases too, but one of the things you need to know about disease resistance, which really should be the cornerstone of your disease management plan uh, if you're organic, and especially you haven't planted your varieties yet, if you're new, uh, this is what you should be relying on. Uh, some of these are, are just excellent apples. Some of them have multiple disease resistance, and you can refer to our chart that's in the uh, our Apple Hatches Apple Pub online to find out exactly what these things are, are resistant to. Uh, by the way, I also need to mention here that it's a common misconception that the old heirloom cultivars are uh, always disease resistant. That just isn't true. Uh, a lot of these old heirlooms did fine in England or maybe in New England. Uh, and they might do fine in your area, but you really need to, to find out for sure. For instance, Gravenstein, when I tried to grow it down here, just melted with fire blight. And, that would be true of a lot of the other ones. Um, the other thing I need to mention here with the disease resistance uh, when used for disease control is that uh, some of these uh, will be uh, quite susceptible to another disease. So look at the gold rush there, sort of in the middle of that list. Uh, gold rush is a great apple, great keeping apple, great flavor, absolutely immune to scab, very susceptible to cedar apple rust. So just remember, you really need to do your homework before you see. Sometimes in nursery catalogs, you'll just have a little uh, icon there that says uh, disease resistant. Well, you've got to know which diseases, which diseases are in your area. And by the way, to get back to that disease triangle that I said I would refer back to from time to time, gold rush would be fine out west where you might be scab pressure, but there's no eastern red cedars. Okay. All right. Uh, there are some general cultural techniques that you can use, rely on, uh, to help with disease control. But I, I want to emphasize that these cultural techniques will not by themselves usually control the disease, but they can help considerably. So the first two, if we look back at that disease triangle, are aimed at the environment, uh, pruning for light and air and planting on a gentle slope. You're trying to get the air drainage uh, through there. You're trying to get sunlight into the tree, and that helps the leaf surfaces, the fruit surfaces dry out so that a fungi or bacteria uh, can't infect. Okay, so we're aiming that at the environment. Sanitation, removal of infected fruit and wood, well, that's aimed at the pathogen. You're trying to get rid of the pathogen itself. Those things, uh, if you look at the photo there on the slide, you'll see, you could look real closely, you'd actually see a little, little black spots or pycnidia, and that's one of the summer rots, and you've got to get rid of that disease branch. You've got to prune it out, and then you have to get it out of the orchard or burn it. Same thing with fruit. You need to do that. That's aimed at actually uh, getting rid of the inoculum in the orchard. Um, not over or under fertilizing. Over fertilizing is aimed specifically at fire blight, but uh, you, you can't under fertilize either. The tree needs to have enough vigor to, to kind of shrug off some of these problems. Fall mowing is mostly aimed at scab, but it can help a lot of things. And those are both of those last two are aimed at the environment and the pathogen when you're thinking about that disease triangle. All right, let's start with some of the individual diseases. And again, um, I don't want to scare you, but I do want to impress upon you that all of these diseases, with the exception of powdery mildew, which we're just going to just pass over pretty quickly, all of these can can just practically wipe you out of the east. And this is one that's present pretty much everywhere. It's not a big problem in the arid west, but it can be a problem. Um, it's really most easily controlled organically uh, by the resistant varieties. Otherwise, you need to spray uh, pretty much with sulfur. We're still working on, on better fungicides, uh, the research community is. Uh, but sulfur, lime sulfur, Bordeaux, which is uh, copper sulfate, those are all going to be these self-extending fungicides that you're going to have to use, and you have to use them correctly. And for disease control, the main thing you have to remember is that, you, that sulfur has to be on the plant surfaces before 
really should be before uh, a wedding period. That's the wedding period. That's the infection period. Um, so if you have a lot of rain in the area, you're going to and sulfur is water soluble. It's going to wash off. So it could mean in a in a particularly wet spring, it could mean that you're out there spraying a lot, and that's just the way it is right now. Unless you have these scab immune varieties, uh, or like out west, you're in a more arid climate. Um, if you can if you can control those primary infections that happen first in spring uh, by keeping that sulfur on, uh, you're going to have a lot less problems later. There's a lot more details with this, including um, scab prediction chart. And you look at the temperatures, you look at the uh, the period of wetness, and you can predict when there's going to be a scab infection period and make sure that your sulfur's on then. But generally, if you're in most of much of the east, you're going to have to be spraying. Uh, probably every week from you know sometime around uh, petal fall, maybe before petal fall, uh, until uh, until you think that primary infection periods are over. And that's that's a lot. It's a lot of sulfur. At west again, it's going to be a lot easier and uh, not nearly so much a problem. All right, let's move down to my favorite disease. If I can have a favorite disease, cedar apple rust. Again, let's start off by saying that you're not going to have a problem with this in the, in the West. Uh, like I said, it's not a cedar. It's not a true cedar. It's really a juniper. But this organism, this fungus, has to go back and forth. It has to have both hosts, the eastern red cedar and apples. And uh, on the slide there, you can see you know, the rust on the apples. And, and you can see the overwintering gall that would be on the cedar tree uh, to get to uh, control methods, um, there, are, there is a lot of resistance. Again, I'd refer to Astra's uh, Apple Pub. And look in the back, uh, there's a chart that, that lists uh, the resistance of a lot of different uh, cultivars, varieties. And uh, the sprays for scab will usually control this. But if for some reason you've got a new orchard and you've, you've wanted to plant, say, Gold Rush in the east where you've got cedars around, and you're not spraying for scab because you don't need to because gold rush is immune, then you can time the sprays with the appearance of these gelatinous horns. If you look at that photo there on the slide, you'll see these strange looking thing. It looks like it fell out of a UFO and uh, and they're kind of jelly like. But those are the that's the fruiting structure that emits the spores that affect the apple trees. By the way, this organism usually does not affect the fruit, but it can. It's usually a foliar disease. And let's go back and look at that one. Yeah, it's a foliar disease. Look at the apple leaves there. And uh, sometimes it's so bad that the tree will defoliate. If that ever happens to you, you can give the trees a little boost with some compost tea or, or um, something quickly soluble and, and help that tree put out a new, new crop of leaves. All right. Powdery mildew. Uh, like I already said, this is not a, a, a serious problem. Uh, well, I should put it this way, it's not as serious uh, as these other diseases. But there are a few uh, susceptible cultivars that, that will require some help, and, and one of those is Braeburn, which has gotten quite popular, uh, especially out west. And those of you who are western growers know that powdery mildew can indeed be a problem. Uh, it's mostly a, a problem because um, the leaves lose some of their photosynthetic capacity. So, uh, and then you can see on the fruit, it can mar the fruit with what they call webbing. Uh, sulfur will control it, yes, but powdery mildew is a strange disease that doesn't, uh, actually doesn't like um, free water. It likes high humidity, but not free water. So it often becomes a problem in the uh, early midsummer. And uh, usually your sprays with sulfur are done by then, and sulfur in hot weather can cause uh, some phytotoxicity can burn the leaves. So uh, it is easy to control after that if you do have a problem with uh, uh, some organically improved uh, baking soda type products, uh, potassium bicarbonate. I think one of them is called Cali Green, but anyway, there are some good organic options. And that's one of those things that anything to improve air and sunlight uh, really will help. Again, it's not a panacea, but it's pretty close. Fire blight. Um, Bad disease. And again, it's present in all of the apple growing regions. Uh, the West has to, to share its uh, depredations with us, in this case, with us back east. 
And some of the most popular varieties in the marketplace right now are particularly susceptible, Fuji and Gala uh, being maybe foremost among those. Uh, if you've got those varieties and you know you have a fire blight problem, you're going to have to spray. And uh, streptomycin, it's an agricultural grade antibiotic, uh, is the old standby. But now we have a new one called blight ban, and it's a, it's a biocontrol. It's actually a, another organism. It's a fungus that um, works. You can find out more about how it works. It's kind of elegant. I don't have much time here, so we're going to skip that. But you have to spray during bloom time. Because that's when the major infection period is. Now, if you look at those photos, you'll see the shoots that are affected. Well, that's correct. Uh, there can be some spread right to the shoots, but the major infection is on the bloom, and then it usually gets into the vascular system of the wood and, and travels down and, and causes the damage. It can, in really rapidly growing shoots, which tend to be very soft and succulent, there can be direct penetration of shoots. So that's why we say at the very bottom there, avoid vigorous growth. Don't over prune and don't over fertilize if you have a fire blight susceptible varieties. Okay. Summer rots. Summer rots, um, one of the things that would nearly my undoing uh, as an orchardist, and uh, for those of us back east, uh, uh, I think they're a little scary. Uh, as we move into organic production or even, you know, um, reduced spray programs, um, we're finding that this is one of those diseases that was covered up before. We didn't see so much of it for two reasons. If it's a young orchard, uh, it's one of these diseases that kind of settles in. As the orchard gets older, it builds up on the, uh, let me show you this slide there. You can see the bark lesions. It build up on the bark if you don't prune those uh, infected limbs out of the orchard or, or burn those uh, prunings, uh, the, the problem will build up. Also, if the canopy of these older orchards start to um, shade the orchard, uh, that's a better environment. Back to that disease triangle, right? You've got a better environment. Well, I thought that maybe uh, dwarfs, dwarf trees, would be a little bit better uh, because of the uh, better air, sunlight penetration. I was talking to Dr. Kurt Rome at the University of Arkansas, who's got an organic planting um, enterprise uh, on dwarfing rootstocks. And uh, to me, they look quite open. Last year, using the best organic practices that he knew of, and I'd say it was a pretty good program from what I saw, uh, he lost 30% of his fruit. And uh, I'll tell you from my own experience that you can lose a lot more than that. Uh, some other orchardists back east here that uh, Ed Fackler in Indiana, a great guy, and, and a very intelligent orchardist, told me that this was going to be the one when we figured out the plum cuculea, it was going to be these summer rots that were going to be the major impediment to organic orcharding. There's really no resistance to speak of, but there is some escape, so to, so to speak, but with real early varieties and to some degree with real late varieties. All right, there's enough scare stories, let's move on. Sooty blotch and fly speck. Uh, sounds like an old buddy movie, huh? So do Blotch and Fly Speck. These are, it could be a, a comedy too. Uh, <laughs> they're really not that serious. They look horrible, uh, but they're really not. They're superficial fungi, and by that I mean they're just on the skin. They're actually eating a little bit of the uh, waxy cuticle, the natural waxy cuticle on the apple. As you can guess by the looks of them there, uh, the yellow varieties are going to show it a lot worse. Uh, there are some varieties, super early varieties, pristine is a yellow variety, it doesn't show it at all, it's just too darn early. And there's some of the old russeted varieties like uh, Roxbury russet and Goldman russet that don't seem to get it hardly at all. Looks like some of the best research we've got for a good organic control for this, because this is one of those things that comes on midsummer, and uh, even the sulfur did work and it doesn't work well, uh, you're, you're taking a chance of other kinds of damage to the tree using the sulfur. But again, this baking soda product, uh, about every two weeks, appears to work. This is some really good research that's coming out of the University of Wisconsin. And my old buddy, Matt Stasiak up there. Hope you're listening, Matt. And now this is a uh, brush washing, by the way. I see that I'm looking at my own slide. Brush washing can, can help a little bit, but you're still going to have some problems in the calyx and in the stem in there where it kind of fits in. Some people mistake it. Some consumers might mistake it for pesticide residue, which is really ironic. But anyway, it really doesn't hurt the apple very much. I mean, it doesn't hurt uh, 
the consumer either. An apple that's this ugly as the pictures here might be a little much to, for your consumers to uh, overcome. But um, if you if you can do something to control it, and again, by opening the pruning for air and light, and maybe some of these uh, baking soda products, and then have some some discussion, some good communication with your clientele, you might be able to get around some of that. All right, insect pests. Again, here's a map that shows you what the major pests are going to be in the various regions. Again, you can see that back east, uh, you've got a few more than you do out west, although you definitely have your share out west, too. Even if you have fewer species, there's still plenty of pressure in most apple growing districts out west. Again, you can refer to this in, on our actual website in the Apple publication, so don't worry about trying to memorize it all now. And clay. Hooray for clay. This is the surround, kale and clay. And if you're not already familiar with this, this clay is, is, uh, has been used for a long time in uh, tummy medicines like kale pectate, peptobismol. It's the clay that's in there that helps neutralize acids in your stomach or absorb them or something. Um, and it's also been used in toothpaste and things. What I'm trying to get at is that its uh, safety is, is assured. This is not a, anything that we need to worry about for toxicity, so it's great. And um, it um, doesn't really kill the pest either, so it doesn't really put pressure on the pest for the pest to develop resistance to it. It's a repellent. Uh, the insect lands on it. Sometimes the dust gets into the integuments in, the, in its insect shell, in the exoskeleton. It irritates it. Or uh, another way that it works, apparently, is that the pest simply doesn't recognize the host. It's reflecting light. And the insect eye, apparently, uh, doesn't see this the same way. It looks weird enough to us. But the insect, that's a lot of reflected light. And they don't even recognize or, or, or can't find their their uh, host. Um, I actually think this is revolutionary. Uh, this is this product here is the first uh, really effective uh, product that we've been able to bear organic that is uh, against the plum curculio. And we'll get to the plum curculio here in a second. It's not quite a silver bullet. This stuff does wash off, so it means again in a wet spring uh, you've got to uh, do a lot of repeat sprays, maybe. And there's a few pests, like maybe the European sawfly. Uh, my friend Michael Phillips up in New Hampshire, the author of The Apple Grower, uh, he said you might have to put on three, you might be able to have to maintain about three coats of thickness to deter the sawfly. Uh, and it's, there's a possibility that it might uh, interfere with mite predators. So we're starting to see uh, in some plantings where this has been used for a while or maybe pretty heavy into the summer. Uh, that is interfering with the beneficial mites and spiders that feed on the bad guy mites. So we may have a few problems with it, but overall this stuff is really amazing and, and it's one of the things that's really made me very optimistic and hopeful about uh, organic apple orcharding in the east especially. In the west, by the way, uh, one, of the, one of its benefits is that it um, uh, helps with the light intensity. Somebody, you can spray it to keep your apples from getting sunburned, which for those of us in the East, we may not even understand as a problem, but for the Westerners it is. So anyway, all right, apple maggot. Uh, most seriously, it's a problem in the Northeast, uh, even though it, it says maggot makes it sound like a fly. It's not really. It's a primitive wasp or bee, and uh, it's a serious pest. It's serious enough that in the Northwest, where it's been found, but it hasn't really achieved pest status yet. Uh, there's a plant quarantine trying to make sure they keep that that sucker out. Not really a sucker; it's a sawer, sawyer. Uh, when it tries to lay its eggs, it kind of saws. Anyway, um, if you look at our our pub, you'll find more information on it. Uh, the clay will work on it. Uh, there's also, you look at the picture there on the right, you can see the trap, the sticky trap. They're attracted to white and yellow. Uh, you put on that tangle foot. You can buy them like that, actually. But uh, you can actually trap them out if you put enough in there. All right, again, anytime you can get more information from our Apple Pub online. Codling moth, this, again, is one of those uh, pests that's a problem throughout all apple growing regions. And it used to be really, really tough in the so-called good old days 
oh, in the early part of the 20th century, early 1900s, they used lead arsenate sprays to control this thing. So uh, the good old days maybe weren't always that good. Anyway, you can see a picture there of the adults in the larval forms. Uh, a lot of great research has been done with this. Uh, there's a, a, a Codlemoth virus. I want to mention Dr. Louis Falcon, Falcone, uh, who spent years and years trying to research this and to get it uh, registered for use. And it finally is available to organic growers as Sid X. Uh, there's been some excellent work with pheromones, both for trapping and monitoring and for uh, mating disruption. And uh, those systems are, are available commercially. The clay works, the kaolin clay, the ceramic works, but often if you've got a big, uh, if you have an established calling moth problem, you probably have to get that good. And then a lot of beneficial insects help too. So let's keep moving. Here's, here's the one. For eastern growers, this, Rodale even called this the Achilles heel of organic growers, and this is the one that, that put so many of us uh, young, would-be organic growers out of the business back in the 70s and 80s. Um, I've got a little, the, the slide there shows uh, some of the life phases, and I want to talk just a tiny bit about the, the um, um, life cycle, because this determines what kind of controls we do uh, that we bring to bear against it. It overwinters as an adult, okay, and then in the spring, and that's in the woodlands next year, which in the spring, uh, it moves in about bloom time, and it begins feeding on apples. It makes this little, let's see, which picture is it? Nope, that's that one. Okay, you might be able to see, I can't see it on my screen, I'm sorry, but it makes a little uh, uh, oviposition egg laying scar. What it does, it lays the egg, and then it makes a little crescent shaped scar to help the skin uh, flap kind of loosen so that the growing apple uh, doesn't press against the egg and destroy it. So anyway, that's a very, distinctive way to monitor for plum peculiar damage is that crescent scar. And so this starts about uh, bloom time, petal fall, and it continues for three to four weeks. And then when the apples are feed and when they're feeding inside the apple, they actually release an enzyme that causes uh, the apple to drop to the ground and it exits through the bottom, exits through the bottom of the apple and pupates in the soil. Now you'll see as we move on that this actually helps a little bit in and deciding uh, there's the rest of the life cycle and deciding what to do about it. You can see that thing, of course, that's greatly, greatly magnified. It is really hard to see. It's a very uh, small beetle, Cuculeonid, and uh, again, if you paid attention to the life cycle there, you can see that it's often not anywhere near where we can uh, find it. Clay, 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 hooray for clay. Clay is, is the, the big thing that makes it possible for uh, us eastern organic growers to uh, finally control the Plumcaculia organically. And uh, so if you just start at petal fall and, and keep that clay on for uh, three, four, maybe up to six weeks, and you can put up some traps. Traps are commercially available. Again, look in our in Astra's uh, Apple Pub and you'll find where to get those traps. But uh, there are some, some, there's some really good research going on. Uh, a lot of it's at Michigan State, um, and they're doing some fabulous work up there. And uh, you'll see the, the picture there is uh, a technique that they're experimenting with called the uh, push-pull. And uh, this is Mark Whalen and his group up there that's done this. And you spray the interior orchard uh, heavily with the surround. So the plum peculio can't really find the host or doesn't like to be in there. And uh, they prefer those outside rows anyway because remember they're coming from the woodlands, coming from the woodlands. And, uh, and then and those little pyramids represent traps. Uh, and then you can spray those outside, those outside uh, perimeters when the trap shows that it's time with pyganic or some other organically approved uh, insecticide that works and really start to knock back successive generations of the, of the plum cuculeo. Uh, livestock foraging, chickens, chickens, chickens. If you only have a few, and I imagine most of you are thinking about commercial production, but if you only have a few trees, chickens can work wonders. Uh, if you put so many under the tree to keep the ground bare, which is how they used to do in the old days, either with cultivation or with animals, uh, you can control that thing. Because remember, 
it pupates in the soil. Uh, again, Michigan State, uh, being very innovative, uh, they're looking at hogs, and there's a cooperative grower, a certified organic grower, I understand, I wish I remember his name, but uh, working with the university there and doing some great research. Uh, remember I said that pyganic works, it does, but I'd reserve it for emergencies. It is a pyrethrum type insecticide, so it, it, it kills everything uh, insect-wise. So you're killing beneficials too, so you should always use uh, broad spectrum insecticides uh, minimally. All right, Oreo fruit moth. This is a problem uh, in sections of California. Uh, it's de definitely a problem in much of the east, especially the, the upper south and south. And uh, again, the clay works, but it's usually too late. Uh, I used, when I was growing organically, I used a pheromone disruption system that was very good. And, uh, and then you could also use uh, insecticides like Pyganic timed with a pheromone trap. By the way, you can tell the difference between the oriental fruit moth and the, and the uh, cobbling moth. They're both not foods. They're related to one another. But in fact, you can buy pheromone traps and disruption systems for both of those together. But uh, if you're wondering which one you have, uh, the oriental fruit moth tends to tunnel around sort of irregularly. The koala cobbling moth uh, kind of targets the uh, seed cavity. OK. Um, Minor and induced pests, and induced by broad-spectrum insecticides. And this is what I was alluding to when I talked about pyganic. This, this was a serious problem uh, with conventional pesticides. Uh, they had a term they called the pesticide treadmill. Um, and what that refers to is that when you kill spot Coming up the possibilities of scale, and in that picture there, if you look at the little bitty tiny white dots there on that calyx end of the fruit, uh, that's that's scale. It's a teeny tiny little sedentary insect, but uh, if you're over reliant on on pesticides, broad spectrum pesticides, it can become a serious problem. Uh, most organic growers don't see that, uh, but and if you do, then you can use the uh, dormant oils to try that. But mites are another example. Sometimes aphids, sometimes aphids come in on their own, but sometimes aphids are induced pests. Um, beneficial insects can very often take care of these things, again, if you don't otherwise disrupt them. Uh, when Tammy gets in, uh, involved here, tells you about farmscaping, uh, that's often uh, the type of insect that farmscaping can really help. Bores, uh, apple tree bores are very serious, uh, especially for organic growers. A lot of conventional growers don't even know they exist. Uh, but for us, with more targeted sprays or very few sprays, uh, and with the long egg laying period of these things, uh, the adults fly in from nearby woods again and uh, lay their eggs, usually in some kind of bark abnormality, uh, sometimes a graft union, uh, sometimes some little um, old scar or wound on the tree, they'll pick that to lay their egg in. Uh, the round-headed apple tree borer prefers to lay right at the, at the ground level. It actually can be the, it is, uh, the single biggest mortality factor of the total tree, of the tree itself. So it's what they're going to kill your trees if you don't, in, in the east anyway, uh, if you don't take some uh, protection measures. There are some um, borers in the west uh, but mostly in the coastal west and not so much in the in the interior part of the west. Uh, the clay is really kind of impractical uh, it, because of the long laying period here. Pretty simple. I can't tell you how many things that we tried young organic orchard back in the day. Uh, we, we painted things on that bark and we tried all kinds of bizarre insecticides and, and paste of cow manure and stuff, you know, the old things out of old books. Uh, Really, the, the easiest thing to do is wrap the tree with screen. And, and I'd suggest you do it. If you're anywhere near woods, uh, go ahead and wrap those trees. It needs to be kind of snug at the bottom and tight at the top. You don't want to gurgle trees. So you might want to look at it once or twice a year. But And if you really do uh, see that, and you can tell when they're in there, because the hole, the entry hole, is usually be apparent, and there'll be a little bit of sawdust and frass uh, where that hole was or there at the base of the tree that you can see. 
All right, uh, cat facing insects. This is going to be one of those problems. It really is uh, a Western problem. Uh, we're talking about uh, stink bugs, tarnished plant bugs. Back east, a new one. I even hate to say the word, the marmorated brown uh, uh, stink bug. Anyway, that's they uh, they feed with their piercing sucking mouth parts on the young fruit, killing the cells, and then the, the apple kind of grows around those dead cells and leaves these. Uh, distorted apples and somebody said it looked like a cat face. I don't know who the heck that was. But anyway, that's why they call them cat facing insects. This is a, a strange one as far as farmscaping goes because uh, you can actually induce a problem yourself by mowing. If you have a lot of these in the ground cover, you can mow and then kind of force them up into the trees. So you have to be careful if you have clovers and things like that that they like that you either leave a strip when you mow or that you mow kind of high or something like that. Uh, pyganic works, that's probably the kind of thing you're going to have to use. Uh, but again, don't use pyganic unless you know. So go in there and look and see if you really have a problem. Uh, do a little bit of monitoring before you start spraying. Real quickly, vertebrate press, uh, pests, deer and voles. Voles can, can be another serious problem. A lot of us organic orchardists want to uh, mulch, and it's great. Mulch is a fabulous way to uh, improve uh, soil structure, fertility, and um, oh gosh, what it? water, good grief, it's great for water relations. But anyway, most mulches tend to attract the bowls. They're, they're kind of shallow tunnels, shallow tunnelers in the orchard floor. And if you can use something like coarse wood chips that they can't tunnel in, you won't encourage them. At the very least, pull back here. If you use mulch, which again, I, I would recommend, but uh, if you have a bowl problem, uh, pull, pull that mulch back. Or even if you don't, <laughs> don't encourage you, pull that mulch back. All right, lastly here for me anyway, deer. Deer, 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 deer. I don't know. Makes me want to cuss, but I'll try not to. Um, really a problem in the east, and I'm sure a problem out west for you guys too, at least in places I'm sure there's got to be a problem. And uh, there's all kinds of, of deterrents out there. You can go the super um, fence, you know, the, the high, uh, thick, impenetrable fence with the machine gun nest at the corners and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they are hard to keep out. One of the things that I found that finally worked for me, oh, and all the repellents, by the way, I want to mention that. They, the deer are smart, and they'll quickly figure out you're just bluffing, or, or they get inured to the, uh, the repellent, the smell, all these different, you know, human hair, rotten eggs, all of them work for a very short period of time. And a lot of you out there know what I'm talking about. And then they stop working. Here's the thing, the picture I'm showing on this slide, uh, that uses the deer's brain against themselves. You get them to associate, this is electric fence, electric wire, to associate apples with pain. Take some of your call apples and push them down on that wire. Somehow attach them to the wire. If you don't have call apples, um, a peanut butter sandwich <laughs> made with foil for the bread. Just put some peanut butter piece of foil and, and squish that over the, the wire there. But get the deer to put their nose to that thing, and uh, they'll learn. All right, I've taken up a lot of time, so let's move on to, to Tammy here in, in orchard floor management. Tammy, you ready? I sure am. Thank you, Guy. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, um, thanks for the overview on pest management. And I'm going to talk about orchard floor management and then finally marketing and economics. If you are establishing your organic apple orchard, it is important to start with good fertility. Apple trees prefer high organic matter and about an average soil pH of about 6.5 on sandy soils and 6 on clay soils. With apples, it is important to monitor your nitrogen use. Another thing to keep in mind is not to apply, later, uh, apply nitrogen later than the end of July or your fruit quality might suffer and winter survival of the tree could be adversely affected. I recommend getting your soil tested to get baseline data. Then get a soil test annually or at least biannually, biannually for ongoing monitoring of your soil conditions. Your county cooperative extension office typically will offer soil testing for a nominal fee. 
These tests usually base their recommendations on conventional fertilizer amounts, so you got to keep that in mind. If you would like conversion rates, however, um, for organic fertilizer materials from the conventional soil test results, call ATRA because we have materials on that topic or specialized specialists that can get that information for you. Also, as Guy mentioned earlier, see the ATRA publication, Tree Fruits, Organic Production Overview for more details on fertility management in orchards. On your screen here is red clover. It's a biennial cover crop that provides nitrogen. It is, a good, it is good to plant a cover crop when establishing an orchard site, and this is a good one to, to try. It can provide mulch, fertilizer, beneficial insect habitat, and between row ground cover and weed suppression when you do plant your trees. Weed management is a critical and challenging component of a successful organic orchard. Some organic weed management tools are listed here on your screen. I will be discussing these in more detail in the next few slides. Also of note in this slide is a picture of Homemaker's Orchard, an organically managed diversified orchard in the Bitterroot Valley of Montana. Note their thick understory. Kurt and Pam Clevenger keep their orchard this way intentionally, touting the habitat for beneficials that the understory provides, as well as the extensive nitrogen-fixing plants that are present in their orchard mix. As Guy mentioned in an earlier slide, very coarse wood mulch can be used to prevent weeds and also rodents from girdling the tree trunk. But it is important to note that this is only the case with coarse mulch, as you see in the picture on your screen. While finer mulch material may break down and provide added organic matter, it can harbor rodents. In the case of using fine mulch, fine wood mulch or straw, keep mulch away from trees to prevent rodent damage to tree trunks or you can wrap the trunks well below the soil surface as you see in this picture. For a living mulch, you can plant subterranean clover into established orchards to provide mulch, fertilizer, between row ground cover, and beneficial insect habitat. This clover receives itself in early summer and dies back during the hottest part of the growing season. It leaves a relatively thick weed a variety of orchard crops in California, but not where winter temperatures regularly drop below zero degrees. Geotextile mulching is another um, way to prevent weeds, and it may, but you need to keep in mind, it may prevent water infiltration during heavy rains. Its advantages are that it has a long life, up to 10 years, and it and as I mentioned, it does an excellent job of preventing weeds. If you are planning on using cultivation equipment, be sure to keep it shallow to prevent root damage. There are a variety of implements such as weed harrows and that are also offset from the tractor to get under the, the trees. These implements can be expensive though and they are often used by larger orchards. The Wonder Weeder, as seen on your screen here, is a ground-driven rolling cultivator with a spring blade that works in between the trees. Research based on a grant from the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, Education Service showed that it, after three years of cultivating two times per year, it effectively managed weeds compared to herbicides. The disadvantages, though, is that the specialized equipment can be really expensive, so you got to keep that in mind. Michigan State University, as um, Guy mentioned in an earlier slide, has done some research with hogs grazing in apple orchards. The hogs reduce the incidence of weeds and pests in the orchards. The disadvantages of the system, however, is that the timing is off with the organic standard for raw manure. It requires a 90-day interval between application and crop harvest. So they haven't quite got that worked out yet, but it is, it is an effective way if you're not certified organic to manage weeds and pests. Organic apples can give you a market advantage. Some apples will sit for a while before they are sold, and organic apples tend to be from wholesalers right away. 
However, certification requires a three-year transition and extensive record keeping. The costs are different depending on the certifier. Some important first steps in beginning the organic certification process include contacting a certifier that is accredited with the USDA National Organic Program. If you have trouble finding one in your region, one of our ATRA agriculture specialists can refer you, or you can go to the National Organic Program website shown here on your screen for a list. Once you have completed your application, you will need an outline that is called an organic system plan. This basically is a blueprint for the certifier and for yourself on how you will manage your farming system to stay in compliance with organic standards. ATRA has organic system planning templates available for orchards that you can access through our website or by calling our 1-800 line. You must adhere to this plan for three years with annual inspections to ensure that you are complying. Also, when transitioning, you should consider that you will not be able to say that you are certified organic, and thus you will not receive a price premium, but you will most likely experience a cost increase due to higher labor and pest management costs. So you definitely need to consider that when transitioning to organic. Before transitioning an existing orchard or starting a new one, it is important to determine the cost compared to the potential re revenue. This slide is based on a study by Cornell University professors Ian Merwin and Gregory Peck from their publication, A Grower's Guide to Organic Apples. It is based on the cost from an organic Liberty apple orchard in New York. It breaks down the cost into machinery costs, material costs, which include, I, I don't have it, I do have it listed here on the, the screen, dormant sprays, insecticides, surround, um, which Guy mentioned earlier, pheromones, fungicides, and fertilizers, as well as labor costs. As you can see, the material costs are significant given the extensive pest complex for apples in the eastern U.S. These material costs might be significantly less in a western orchard. This chart is explained in more detail in the recently updated ATRA publication, Apples, Organic Production. And I should mention that this publication, as much as we try to get it done by the webinar, will be available online and to be mailed out in two weeks. It, um, the older version is on the website now, but the, the updated version will be available, in, I've been told, in about two weeks. It is also important to keep in mind that this is just a baseline for your decision making. Once you develop your own system, it is important to keep records and note what your own costs are for your product in order to see what areas you can be more profitable in. When considering the profitability of organic apples, you also need to determine your potential sales. Direct market prices for apples vary depending on your location and the type of market. I will discuss the potential markets in the next few slides, but if you intend on direct marketing your apples, this is in sales potential in your area. Visit the local farmer's market and price the apples and any value-added products that they have there. You can also visit co-ops and natural food stores to see their retail prices on organic apples. If you intend on selling to them, ask how much per week they would buy. Write a list of those potential markets and how much your projected sales might be for those markets. If you have existing markets already, ask them if they're still on board if you're going to be certified organic and see if they will give you a price premium. A sales chart will look something like the chart on your screen here. The total projected sales for each variety is listed on the far right hand um, side of this table. So keep that in mind for the next slide. On your screen now is what I call a profitability index, and I just did this for Gala apples. I'm assuming that there is about a third, that this farmer has about a third of an acre of galas. The production cost I extrapolated from the chart a few slides back, the cost. I, around, I rounded this number up, though, assuming that it would be just a little bit more if somebody's just growing a third of an acre. The gross revenue figure I got from the previous slide. The final number you see here is a net return of about $4,300 for a third of an acre. If this is not a satisfying number for you, 
given all the costs, it would be important to look at the costs in the sales area of your farm to see where improvement could be made. When you are determining how to market your apples, you should consider your location, your personality, and the scale that you're farming at. All of these factors help determine the market path that you pursue. Many organic apple producers will have multiple market outlets. This helps to spread the risk out among many markets in case one happens to not perform as well over a season. Farmers markets will provide a price premium, but you have to keep in mind that it requires the time to prepare and time to sit at. It can be a gratifying experience selling at a farmers market because you are interacting directly with the consumer. However, they do require extensive preparation and selling time, and you have to be a people person. Farmers markets are also useful, or what I like to say are a low risk, if you're just starting out. You bring what you have to the market, and there's no contractual obligations. In this next picture here, there's, um, this is Elderberry Pond Restaurant and Farm, some friends of mine in New York State. They have a lot of heirloom apple trees and use many of the products from the farm in their restaurant. Many restaurants are trying to capitalize on the buy local movement and are excited to take your farm product. The key is being organized, clean, and adhering to their packing standards. It is also to help it's also helpful to fax some weekly availability lists, especially if you have multiple products that you're marketing to them. Typically, value-added products, such as apple butter and cider, will require special equipment and thus higher equipment costs, something you need to consider when you're doing your enterprise budget. In addition, the US Food and Drug Administration currently recommends all cider processing facilities, regardless of size, to have a HACCP plan or a hazard analysis cr critical control point plan. <laughs> Try to say that 10 times fast. A HACCP plan is a process that identifies areas within your processing facilities that need attention because of potential food safety problems. Because of the increased scrutiny of processing apples into unpasteurized cider, we encourage you to contact your state department of agriculture and or your health department. It's different from state to state to determine your state's regulations for processed products before in investing in equipment. But it can be a great way to use your, um, your dropped apples or ap second apples. So wholesale typically requires a lot of product, but not as much time in marketing. Many direct markets require significant amount of significant amounts of time, however, but their returns are higher. Wholesale markets can be directly to a small store that may not require as much volume or to a wholesale supplier that sells to other stores. These typically have significant volume requirements and packing requirements. The price premium is lower, but depending on your location, if you're out in a very rural area um, or your level of interest in dealing with the public, it may be for you. You may also need to have a HACCP plan in place depending on what the supplier is, is requesting. The chart on your screen here demonstrates the organic wholesale prices at a northeastern and a western terminal or wholesale market from 2007 to 2009. As you can see here, the overall trend in these markets is going down. I surmise that this is because organic apple production is increasing and thus the overall supply is increasing but you still get a price premium, as you can see on your screen. I encourage all farmers considering organic apple production to look at their potential markets as well as the costs associated with managing this crop organically before beginning the process of transition. The rewards are many, including the value of on-farm environmental quality and worker safety as well as a price premium. The pest complex that Guy detailed earlier gives the eastern U.S. a disadvantage, but many successful organic apple farmers are making it work through direct markets and the support of grower networks. The resources here on your screen are ones that we have found to be useful for new and tradition trans Bear in mind that this is only a partial list. There's so many great resources out there now. Um, 
But these and many of the other resources are available in the recently updated ATRA publication, Apple's Organic Production. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff Berkby to, to end it. Uh, thanks again, Tammy and Guy, for the presentation. And uh, before we end, we will spend a few minutes on some questions and answers. We had probably 50 or 60 questions ans asked during the last hour and uh, have had over 300 uh, people online during the presentation. Again, a quick reminder, if you missed anything during the live broadcast today, the entire webinar and the Q&As will be online um, within a day or so on our ATRA website. So you can watch and listen to the entire webinar at your leisure at any time. Um, some of the questions we, re we received during the last hour dealt with more specific disease issues and some more about trends in organic health and others. So I'll ask, um, I'll throw out some questions and both Guy and Amy, um, Guy and Tammy can respond as they desire. Um, a couple questions about how viable is it for independent apple growers to try to preserve heritage apple cultivars from abandoned orchards. Can they uh, take the uh, graphs and, and use those and try to incorporate it into their orchards, and, and does that work? Guy or um, hey, uh, Tammy, if you want to tackle that one. Well, I'll, I'll do it, Tammy, if you don't mind. I've, yeah, I uh, think been you would be better suited for that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've been a nursery for many years, so I know what it takes to, uh, an apple nursery specifically, so I know what it takes to, uh, uh, to, get, the, to get an old tree like that to take. And, and one of the things that's difficult is getting the right size, vigorous wood uh, you basically need uh, something that's roughly pencil diameter and has to be of the current season's growth, you know, last year's growth. It has to be one-year wood, in other words, uh, to propagate from. Uh, and I can't get into the reasons for all that, but that's the only thing you can use. And uh, so these old trees, now if they've survived a long time, you know, without care uh, in somebody's uh, yard or pasture or something, that's great. That's a great sign that they really are reasonably well adapted to the area. Uh, but when they're old like that, they're not very vigorous usually and they don't produce that kind of wood. So you may have to give them a shot of fertilizer or you might have to prune them back pretty good to uh, get the tree to produce some, some rapidly growing shoots that you can propagate from. And then after that, you need to get a good book or go online and find a video on how to butter graft. But yeah, if it's showing that it's adapted to the region, that, that may not be a bad idea. Guy, a follow-up question too. Again, this is Jeff Berkby. Are there good okay. sources in the uh, commercial market for purchasing heritage apple varieties, or is it does it depend on the part of the nation you're in where to buy those, or how, how do you find out where where good sources are for heritage apples? Uh, there's some great ones actually, uh, and you can buy the cyan wood too. And I'm uh, offhand, I have can't think of the names of some of the places you get cyan wood, but uh, you know, get online and, and look for that. Uh, there's one, I'm not sure, they changed their name, Sonoma County, Apple out west in California. It's got a lot. The real trick with these heirlooms that I kind of uh, alluded to earlier is that just because they're an old one doesn't mean that they're necessarily uh, disease resistant. You know, you can look at like Grobenstein. did fine in Europe. You bring it over here. Now, historically, Europe didn't have fire blight, so there was no reason for those trees to develop any resistance to that disease. You bring them over here, whoo, lousy. They can really get hammered. So just be careful, you know, what you grow. I mean, down here, I've tried so many of these. Uh, Wolf River, I tried to get Wolf River to grow in Arkansas, and it just was like sawdust in a paper sack. It uh, just wasn't too good. It's a great apple in Wisconsin or Minnesota, but not in Arkansas. So uh, before you put a lot of time and money into the, these heritage varieties, Try to determine where they're from or try to you know, find out through NAFEX. There's a great one, NAFEX.org, N-A-F-E-X, North American Fruit Explorers. These, this is an amateur fruit growers. In that same vein, Guy, um, we had a, an apple grower ask about some gaps he has in his current orchard, and he's got some uh, susceptibility to scab with his current trees. And he's wondering if he, does, if he did plant, plant scab resistant varieties in those gaps, would that help reduce his need to spray overall in the orchard? Oh, probably not. <laughs> he won't have to spray those trees for scab. I mean, these, these scab, they say scab resistant, but they really are practically immune. It's pretty amazing. But anyway, uh, no, it's not going to change much. The one thing that might help a tiny bit is 
uh, the buildup of, of resistant organisms, uh, the scab uh, itself. But no, he still it's not going to really affect uh, the, the, the scab that's on those trees now or will remain on those trees unless you take some other precautions. Okay. And again, refer to our apple pub. There's some sanitary things you can do to help get them out of the orchard. But yeah. Well, one question that came up several times, Guy, was the, and you you talk about this in your intro, was the the overall distance, overall difference in cultivation of organic apples in the eastern U.S., where it's hotter and humid and more pest mm -hmm. um, issues, and the arid west. And as as I think you mentioned, that Washington State dominates the organic apple market because of the aridity and the ability to uh, not have to deal with the pest issues. Are there issues though in the west that are peculiar to growing apples in the west that um, we didn't really talk about that you might want to address um, specifically to the, the arid west issues? Um, when they do have a problem, you know, sometimes a uh, fire blight, for instance, you might get by a few years where a uh, fire blight just didn't show up, and then when it does, you know, it can just run rampant. And, and maybe that's one of the problems that happens out west is that um, you could be lulled into complacency by not having a problem that, you know, conditions are right. You know, that environment, when it's conducive, whew. same thing with some of the pests, because you don't have uh, maybe a, a, a big insect complex, including beneficials in some of those more arid climates. Uh, you know, calming moth might come in, have virtually no uh, uh, beneficial organisms to keep them in check and just really explode and run rampant. So, um, and I see also out west, we used to see a lot of the, uh, these, these induced pests. You're, you're spraying for cobbling moth, and then you accidentally, through use of broad uh, spectrum insecticides, organic or otherwise, uh, can induce a, a serious mite or scale problem. So that, that's usually the sort of thing that happens out west. It's just these explosions. And it can be serious, very serious. Tammy, a marketing question for you. What about, um, I guess, just overall trends we're seeing nationwide in organic apple production and the perception that there is a growing market here, farmers markets and wholesalers, and are we are we seeing more and more apple growers seriously considering the organic apple market and and actually making a profit at those that uh, get into this? Um, yeah, thanks, Jeff. I I from the trends that I have seen, there's a lot of um, interest from conventional farmers transitioning to organic, and I think that's why. You saw in that last slide with the wholesale costs, um, the prices are going down because um, when people started to see organics as being a trend, um, then they started to um, they they went into that tra three year transition, and now you're seeing those mark those wholesale apples coming to, into the market. Um, you know, I it, I think it just depends on your region, but for direct markets. Um, that's something that I always encourage folks to look at and explore. Go actually go to the farmers market and see are there apple producers there, um, it, or you know talk to restaurants or other um, you know co-ops or local natural food stores to see if that's an area where you can break into and actually get a, a price premium. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Tammy. Um, Guy, back to you. I won't cover a lot of these very specific disease questions. Some of them are very specific to certain orchards, and I'll remind our listeners okay. that they're free to call our 800 number for really technical, specific questions, and Guy and Tammy will probably handle those through our, our normal ATRA questions. But um, we did have some questions about uh, companion planning and permaculture techniques for disease reduction. And you might explain to our listeners what permaculture is and whether or not you've seen any any real successes in using companion planning and permaculture in the approach to controlling pests. I, I think one of the, the best principles in permaculture that, that would apply here is diversity. And it's not so much, um, a lot of times when you think of companion plantings, you think of something that might repel another insect. I think when we're talking about diversity in the orchard situation, what we're talking about is just, you're not so much setting the table for a pest. Uh, so you may have an apple tree, and then maybe you've got you know some open space, and then maybe you've got some you know a different kind of fruit tree, and you know, the way that conventional apple production has been, and it's, this is really a modern phenomenon, people don't understand that it, it, the kind of orchards we have now, it's, it's relatively new. You're really setting the table for a pest, whether it's a disease or an insect, what, what could be easier? 
than just have a, you know, these contiguous blocks, rows and rows of, of apple trees. Uh, so in permaculture, I think it's mostly the diversity. A lot of companion planting things, in my experience, you know, if you're using, I'll just use this example from a garden, you know, garlic might repel a few insects, but you've got to put it right on top of the other plant. Um, and same thing with marigolds, a lot of things like that. It, it's really just got to be immediately next to it. Apple trees being perennials, this gets kind of tricky. But diversity, I think, is, is really key, especially for uh, small-scale plantings, uh, kind of permaculture, you know, homesteading designs. And I'm real optimistic about that. I think it's a great idea, but uh, it's hard to get enough doing things that way to market. But if you're not worried about marketing, then yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Um, well, Guy, I think with that and Tammy, um, Guy, I think your screensaver is on. If you want to move your mouse around, oh. it'll show that again that final <laughs> slide <Thank laughs> for you. everyone. Yep. Which again remind our listeners that the entire webinar is going to be available at our atra.ncat.org site in about a day. Usually it's up this afternoon, but certainly by tomorrow um, or this weekend we'll have the entire webinar up for people to watch. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's question. That's always a problem with webinars when we have over three or four hundred people online. But again, uh, both Tammy and Guy are available through our toll-free 800 number, um, which is if you go to our website, um, um, you'll be able to find that and call anytime and talk with your talk to them specifically about questions about organic apple production. But it is amazing to see how how interesting this topic is now nationwide and how uh, commercial apple growers throughout the nation are looking at options for growing those and the specific problems we face both in the east and the west with organic apple production. So we'll we'll keep our um, fingers on the pulse of al organic apple production here at, at the uh, ATRA program and through NCAT and uh, encourage you to keep in touch with us too. Again, on behalf of the National Center for Appropriate Technology and Tammy and, and uh, uh, Guy, I'd like to thank you both for the presentation today. And uh, keep in touch and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you very much and goodbye.